We're ready to record. Good afternoon. We appreciate everyone joining us today. We are very excited to have Bill Ledger from Design Collaborative with us, who will present on the Capacity Dilemma, Planning for the Surge. This webinar is being recorded and added to the IRHA resources for all of our members around the state. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we begin. As I mentioned, we are recording today's session and it will be available on IRHA's YouTube channel within one week once the recording is processed. If at any point during the presentation you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. This function is accessible by hovering your mouse over the screen. It should pop up either at the top or bottom of your screen depending on what view mode you are in. We reserve the chat function for technical issues, so please use the Q&A section. IRHA staff will keep an eye out for those questions and will moderate so uh, Mr. Ledger does not have to check them during his presentation. We will now begin. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it is a, a pleasure to be able to be with you today. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your busy day, your busy week. Um, I'm sure it's been quite a, quite a year for you all and, um, and, and you're busy with uh, many important things. Uh, we think this is an important topic to consider now while we're, we're kind of in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic, um, how we deal with uh, surges of, of patients in our hospital facilities. And certainly that's been a big concern all year with COVID-19, but uh, it still remains a concern. Uh, we continue to work with hospitals who are, are planning now for uh, still continue to see more patients uh, during this pandemic. Thankfully, there's a vaccination or multiple vaccinations available now, and we hope that uh, in 2021, we'll see this uh, start to decline. But for now, we wanna just uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you too for the Indiana Rural Health Association for allowing us to present this today. We've enjoyed working with them over the years um, and being part of their organization. Some of the things that we'll cover today, we wanna focus on the course, what type of uh, surge uh, capacity events we should be planning for. There's more than just one, of course. Uh, we also wanna look specifically at uh, the rural hospital, uh, some of the challenges that you're facing and, and with those, uh, the opportunities that may come along with those challenges. We'll spend quite a bit of time though, looking at some case studies of some projects that we've been involved with um, both uh, in the past and recently that have some implications uh, as far as how to deal with uh, sudden uh, surges in patient uh, census, um, as well as some uh, temporary facilities that are uh, out there and available to consider as well. Uh, certainly, there's been some um, actions uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic that have been taken by our uh, federal and state regulatory agencies. We'll uh, highlight some of those. Um, and then along with those, there's some infrastructure considerations for your, your facility, the, the mechanical electrical systems that um, may be affected by those uh, regulatory actions. So we'll talk about those. Uh, and then we'll end up by just kind of recapping on how we can apply what we've learned this year from the pandemic um, and make sure as we're planning uh, for the future that we're taking into consideration uh, how we might better plan for uh, surges of patients. We'll leave a little, little time at the end for some questions and answers if you have those. Um, so please uh, write those down. We'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas at the end of the presentation. And hopefully your facility hasn't ended up <laughs> in this the situation in this cartoon. Um, that's pretty extreme, but we certainly don't want to um, uh, avoid uh, the possibility that in your hospital is could be overrun run with a with a surge capacity event. So um, we we take that a little bit of tongue in cheek, but. Uh, so the types of uh, surge events that may affect um, uh, your hospital and all of our hospitals, uh, there's a variety of those. And of course, we're all well too familiar with the, uh, the pandemic type of surge um, that we're experiencing this year. 
Um, we've, all, we've really kind of been dealing with um, surges related to contagious diseases, uh, you know, with the flu seasons, and we've already kind of gotten used to those and, and done some planning, um, making sure hospitals have uh, room and beds available for the flu season. But, you know, we're definitely at a different level this year with, with the COVID-19 pandemic. There's always been natural disasters to, to think about. Uh, you know, particularly here in Indiana uh, with uh, the potential for to tornadoes. We even have flooding uh, areas that um, are a concern. So we definitely want to keep those kinds of things in mind. Some communities have, um, you know, industrial facilities that uh, manufacture or um, deal with large quantities of uh, flammable materials or toxic materials. So uh, industrial accidents are certainly um, one way to another hospital can see a spike in patient um, census. Uh, hopefully we never see an, any more terrorist attacks in our country, but um, it's something we certainly can't avoid now that we uh, have gone through the 9-11 experience back in 2001. So uh, even though you may be a rural or smaller community hospital, that may not be affected by this. You may be near a larger urban center that uh, may need that backup and that assistance. So again, something to consider. And of course, you never know what the future holds, especially you know, in 2019, we had no idea what 2020 would bring. So there may be other types of events that we should be planning on um, at some level uh, to make sure the hospitals are still functioning properly with a high census. As we go through these um, case studies today and, and talk through this presentation, uh, certainly there's an immediate need as I alluded to in, in the opening, but um, again, we just wanna make sure now going forward that we uh, learn from this experience and apply um, the lessons that we've uh, come across uh, through COVID-19 in our planning for the future. So in, a, in our presentation today, we'll, we'll talk about some of the immediate needs uh, that we're uh, dealing with, as well as how do we have planned for better for the future. Looking at the rural hospital, uh, we know that you have many challenges uh, and, and many opportunities as well that may be different from larger rural hospitals. But uh, certainly, um, you know, this year, you know, we've been focused on the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenges that come with that. Um, we grabbed this interactive map, just you may have seen this. This is from usafacts.org. Um, and it's in an interactive map that's showing uh, the new infection rates across the country by county. Um, and then we've done a quick little blow up of our state um, in Indiana here. So the colors, the representation of colors, it's kind of hard to see the legend, but the, the darker gray color are actually the rural counties that uh, in the first week of December of this year, had a new infection rate of uh, 500 or more per 100,000 population. So there were quite a few rural counties, um, you know, earlier this month that were experiencing high infection rates. Uh, similarly, in the blue color, the counties that have more of a metro population, they too, here in Indiana, were seeing over 500 new infection cases per 100,000 population. So our entire state really was seeing uh, uh, quite a surge. And you've probably seen that or experienced that at some level at your facility. So this is certainly a current uh, challenge that, that uh, we're all going through. Uh, but in recent years too, along with this, um, uh, as you can see in these charts, we're looking at um, the occupancy rate uh, for hospitals, and this is a national uh, average that we're looking at, not just specifically Indiana, but uh, these charts represent the, both the occupancy rate change that we've seen in hospitals, as well as uh, the bed surplus change. So, you know, occupancy rates have been dwindling. Um, you know, this chart goes from 2006 to 2016, uh, but I think the trend is continuing where we're starting to see you know, those occupancy rates drop and particularly for uh, the critical access hospitals in the gray bars there in the chart, as well as the rural hospitals in the green bars, 
as you can see, the occupancy rates are, are dwindling down to the 30% range or below. So that, you know, that's a concern and that's a challenge to deal with. And then of course, along with that comes a, bled, a bed surplus or um, where we have more beds available than are needed. So uh, do we have wasted space in these hospitals? And, and that's a concern too. And of course, there's the financial side of that where um, when you have a low occupancy rate and, and, and more beds available than patients, that's gonna affect um, your operating costs, and your profit margins. Uh, this chart again from Modern Healthcare shows that the rural hospital on the left, um, national average, uh, you know, in, in the 2009 to 2015 time period, we're operating at, at a zero or less uh, profit margin, which is really concerning. Um, on the right side of the chart, you know, nationally for urban hospitals. Uh, still uh, doing at least profitable, but still pretty thin, razor thin margins. So we know that there's um, these uh, going on and, and how do we uh, deal with them better from a facility standpoint. So from that, you know, we just discerned some potential opportunities that we've uh, uh, been talking with some of our healthcare clients about. Um, certainly, uh, the opportunity with COVID-19 is for hospitals to come together and, and support each other. And I'm sure some of you have been doing that already, and that might not be anything new, but um, it does, uh, it does uh, it's important to consider that um, even though you may not be experiencing a surge in patients right now, you know, a neighboring uh, community hospital or even an urban hospital could be and hopefully there's a, the ability to share beds and spaces um, back and forth. Um, there's the, op the opportunity to, to increase revenue for those hospitals who may still have a low census and are struggling a bit um, by being able to transfer patients if that's feasible, um, could help um, on that side of things uh, from an, a revenue standpoint. Also what we've you know all know about this year, there's been a either a stoppage of elective uh, surgeries or at least some facilities individually stopping elective surgeries so they have the uh, additional bed capacity that they need. So, you know, that's an opportunity for um, hospitals who don't have that surge currently that they might be able to take on those patients and do those elective procedures, um, you know, if, that, if that's feasible and help them also from that, that standpoint. Um, and then uh, the other potential opportunity of working together is, of course, in the emergency department. We know there can be uh, spikes in, in emergency department occupancy rates. So, uh, again, if hospitals can work together uh, to support each other in that capacity, um, we think that's of great benefit. But each hospital has to be prepared for that. And so that's what we're talking about today is, is planning for that potential. So we'll get into some of the case studies here and just share with you uh, some of the uh, things that we've learned with our clients. And uh, some of these are, are uh, from several years ago, actually. Uh, and, and a couple of these are, are from this year. So uh, again, we wanna highlight that we wanna apply what we've learned um, from all of this for our future planning, but we're also wanna focus too on how we can apply some of these to our, our current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Our first example uh, is uh, St. Rita's Medical Center, which is a rather large hospital in Lyme, Ohio. I think they're licensed for over 400 beds. Um, several years ago, back in 2011, we started the process with them of expanding and renovating their emergency department. Um, so, you know, again, a large emergency department because it's a larger facility. Um, they, we, they ended up with 44 treatment spaces, um, four of those being trauma rooms and, and three behavioral health rooms. But the area that we want to highlight in this project is the area that's boxed out there on the left. And, and that's what's called their mass casualty unit. Uh, and I'll explain that in a little bit here in the next slide. Um, and that area is located next to their ambulance uh, entry as well. So 
It had close proximity to where ambulances were bringing folks. So when we started the design on this project with them, one of the things they told us right up front was that community leaders had approached them with a concern that because in Lima, Ohio, they have a number of industries, uh, as I mentioned, that have um, that work with uh, large quantities of, of flammable materials. They were concerned about <clears throat> an accident occurring at one of those industries and you know, having a large uh, uh, group of people that needed care right away. So when they heard that St. Rita's was, was planning to do this emergency department project, they asked them, is there a way that you can plan for uh, a potential ac industrial accident like this? So uh, we developed what was called the mass casualty unit or the MCU. Um, and we'll show you a plan here in the next slide, but the typical private room in this department was about 145 square feet. These mass casualty rooms, we designed them to 250 square feet uh, to have additional patients in them. Uh, so uh, the, the point here is we were able to um, increase uh, the room size uh, incrementally, but get a much more uh, a larger increase for capacity. So a 75% increase of the room size netted a 200% capacity increase in number of patients. So instead of having just one patient um, in the room, which it typically is set up for, it could go up to three patients. Um, so I'm sorry, as, as you see in this image on the right, uh, that is one of the mass casualty rooms and you can see they, they have this uh, staged right now for uh, the three stretcher positions. Um, one, so some of the features of that room were uh, an elongated head wall so they could disperse the um, medical gas and power outlets and data outlets across the room. Um, one of the side benefits to doing this um, is they also were concerned about what if we have a family that was involved in an accident and, and several family members were injured. They like the idea that now uh, they can actually treat multiple family members in the same space too. So kind of an added benefit you know, on top of what was the original idea for having um, you know, a quantity of, of mass casualties come in. When we were working with them early in design, we looked at a number of different options for how the room could be uh, set up. And in this option, we just wanted to point out that um, we had a vertical head wall uh, idea um, that they actually went away from, but, but there are different ways to set this up. And, and one may be more aesthetic than the others. That's just dependent on what each facility desires, but something to consider. And we also looked at um, how that head wall uh, would make sure to have the proper amount of outlets, you know, six out duplex outlets per bed. So that's a lot of outlets to plan for. Um, and of course you wanna plan for at least one nurse call station per bed um, and have the uh, oxygen and vacuum medical air outlets for each station as well. Um, you might've seen too in that image that we had multiple privacy curtains. Of course you wanna plan those ahead of time uh, to give each patient privacy as needed. Um, so when planning this room, of course, we were using the FGI guidelines as we do uh, here in Indiana uh, to plan for those rooms. So just, you know, quickly that uh, you need to make sure that uh, there's at least 80 square feet per patient station. We were at 250 square feet for this room. So we're just over that requirement. Uh, you have the five foot clearance between beds and you have, you know, the four feet clearance to the wall. So uh, those are some imper important things to keep in mind when planning uh, larger patient, multiple patient rooms. Another uh, hospital that we've worked with recently as well, uh, Rush Memorial Hospital in Rushville, Indiana, just east of Indianapolis. And uh, they are a critical access hospital. Um, the original hospital was built in 1949. Um, in 1969, uh, they built a, an addition uh, that currently has their uh, med surge nursing unit on the second floor. So they approached us um, a couple of years ago to help renovate uh, their 1969 patient rooms. 
Um, and at that time, you know, the main concern was there were, they felt like they were moving, losing patients just because the, the environment wasn't uh, up to today's standards. Uh, so originally the main uh, point of the project was to improve patient satisfaction. And as you can see in this panoramic image, uh, the rooms that were built in 1969 were actually set up for four patients. Um, they weren't using it for four patients at the time that we started the project, um, mainly just as a semi-private room, but there was actually still a head wall in place for a third bed in these rooms. Um, and so in the renovation project, they really wanted them to be private rooms. Um, but they were still concerned about the fact that they do have uh, a census spike there during the flu season. So the, the result of the project was to go ahead and do the interior finishes, but to make sure uh, it still felt like a private room, but had the semi-private room capability. Uh, you can see here on the plan on the right, there was eight rooms that we were working on. Uh, two of those rooms were already private rooms, but there were six rooms that were those larger uh, multi-patient rooms. So our solution was to really focus on making it look and feel like a private room that would be used uh, that way for most of the year. Um, and then uh, when needed, be able to add that second patient without any trouble at all really, other than just moving a bed into the room. This is what they looked like, um, you know, when we started the project, uh, probably very original to, you know, what it looked like in 1969 with some adaptations, but certainly you can see why they wanted to um, make these uh, more like today's standards. So uh, this is an image of one of those multi-patient rooms that shows the, the, the primary um, bed location. The secondary bed location is actually in the foreground out of the picture, but it looks pretty much the same. So when we worked on this project to make it um, a private room and still have the capability of having two beds, uh, we were allowed to do that under the FGI guidelines that states that if you do have an existing room uh, that has more than one patient um, bed in it, you can you can remain having two beds under the current 2018 rule. So we we fell into that okay. Um, square footage wise, these rooms are uh, over 325 square feet, so no issue there. Um, and I, as I mentioned, both bed positions had um, a prime uh, had a new head wall unit, which I'll detail here in the next slide. But we positioned the primary uh, bed location nearest to where the toilet room is, obviously, because that would be the one that would need it the most. Um, the secondary head wall then kind of serves as additional uh, storage, clean storage, um, when it's not being used as a, um, a surge patient room for them. One of the, the challenges with a big uh, room like this is, uh, or a, the way it was arranged, is there's really no foot wall. Uh, so we had to to be careful about where we place TVs to make sure they were uh, up and out of the way when it was being used as a semi-private room, as well as where the, you know, we, we had to position the patient information board um, on a different wall than you would see on a foot wall, as well as the sink. So uh, some, some things we had to work around, uh, but it still worked out uh, really well. The, men, the head wall unit that, that we uh, had we showed you uh, in that picture uh, it was actually a manufactured head wall unit. It was designed actually to literally hang on the wall. Uh, so we didn't have to do any type of wall modifications. Uh, the other uh, feature of this head wall system is that you could connect to existing power and medical gas outlets with flexible connections that all occur behind the head wall unit itself. Uh, so that made for a really um, kind of an easy installation. We didn't have to do a lot of demolition work to, uh, uh, to install these. So that's something to consider. But of course, these types of head walls really dress up the room. They have a real aesthetic appeal to them. Uh, they organize all the outlets and gases nicely and provide additional storage for patients and staff. Um, so it, it does uh, really improve the overall experience of the room. 
And as a result of this project, actually, Rush Memorial had plans to expand their hospital with a new patient addition wing. But once they saw the benefit of, of these renovated rooms, they've actually postponed those plans for now, uh, which obviously saved them uh, costs in, in capital expenditures. So recently we've been working too with um, Parkview DeKalb Hospital, which is located in Auburn, Indiana, north of Fort Wayne. And um, kind of a similar situation. Uh, as you can see here, uh, their original hospital was uh, built in 1959. They're currently licensed for 56 beds. Uh, we actually had worked with them um, back in 2014 and did a, um, a finish renovation project for the patient rooms that they had on the second and third floor of that original building. All of those rooms uh, were semi-private rooms, um, but we did a renovation to make them private rooms. With the caveat though, that we actually kept uh, the medical gases within the walls, um, not on purpose. They just didn't wanna spend the money uh, to remove uh, that medical gas piping and, and the outlets, but we just covered them over with, with new drywall. Uh, so in 2019, uh, Parkview Health here in, in the Allen County area actually acquired Parkview DeKalb, Health, uh, Parkview DeKalb Hospital and um, that actually allowed us to, to work with Parkview Health and, and start to work on renovating these units again to their new standards. So this is what the, the patient rooms look like after the first renovation in 2014 um, to make them private rooms. And as you can see, uh, there's really just the outlets there for the single bed. However, there are still uh, the capability of um, the second bed in these rooms because we didn't take out the medical gases and the power that's behind the drywall. And they were actually really grateful that that was still there because they now are using these again as semi-private rooms. So the lesson, you know, the takeaway from this is, and what they've taken away from this uh, current situation with COVID-19 is, we still wanna have the private room experience, but we still probably ought to plan on having the capability of keeping uh, a semi-private uh, room you know, for a surge event. So uh, the, the project that we were working with them uh, on earlier this year, uh, which is currently on hold right now, uh, was to make them private rooms. And, um, but since, um, you know, the beginning of the year when we uh, were working on this uh, and, and put on hold, uh, we are now hearing from them that they may want to, as I said, um, have the capability of keeping these semi-private at some level. Um, but we've also been modifying some of these rooms too for negative air, which, which I'll touch on here in a bit. We've also worked uh, with Parkview Noble Hospital, which is near uh, Parkview DeKalb, not too far away over in Kendallville, Indiana. Uh, their hospital was built back in uh, 2003 and they're currently licensed for 31 beds. So not a big facility and, and Kendallville located in Noble County actually had uh, quite a spike of um, COVID patients uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So they were really concerned there uh, at the beginning of how they would handle um, you know, this potential surge. Um, so in, in 2008, we actually uh, helped design uh, and build their endoscopy unit addition, which is kind of on the backside of the hospital. Uh, however, this, this uh, particular addition now has even more relevance because they've, they've seen it as a strategic way to um, maybe take on additional patients uh, than they have rooms for currently. So uh, this small addition of course has two procedure rooms uh, but it also has six uh, private uh, prep and hold rooms um, and they're paired together. So they, they share toilet rooms, which is also an advantage. Uh, so they're using uh, this unit as their potential surge area. Uh, fortunately, they haven't had to use it yet, but um, they are prepared to. 
Uh, we did a project earlier this year, a small, very quick project to uh, convert these rooms to negative air. So they're all prepped and ready to go if, if indeed they do have a surge there locally, or they can support other uh, Parkview Health uh, community hospitals nearby, nearby like Parkview DeKalb if needed. So that's another strategy too, uh, to look at those types of spaces as potential uh, patient areas. And this is what they look like. They, uh, they do of course have the, the outlets, the nurse call uh, that, that are needed, the lighting. And of course I mentioned the toilet room that's uh, in there as well, which is a great advantage to these types of rooms. But we just wanted to highlight too some other uh, potential temporary space that, that can be considered. And I'm sure you've all heard uh, of a lot of these. Um, we thought we'd just uh, highlight some of them, some of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and certainly I just kind of mentioned uh, the prep hold or the pre post rooms. Uh, here uh, at Van Wert Health, which is a hospital in Van Wert, Ohio, that we've been working with, uh, they just recently. Uh, completed a, a large expansion there for a new surgical center and which has uh, 18 of these pre and post patient rooms. Uh, you know, we weren't thinking about uh, COVID-19 two years ago when we were designing this, but these rooms certainly could be easily converted to, uh, you know, patient rooms uh, if needed. The one disadvantage is they don't have dedicated toilet rooms, but um, they certainly have all the infrastructure for uh, patient care. Uh, similarly, emergency department room, treatment rooms are another potential surge space. Now, of course, emergency departments um, have their own capacity issues, so we're not necessarily saying treatment rooms should be used as patient rooms, but again, with the idea of uh, some hospitals maybe seeing a lower occupancy rate or, or bed rate even in their emergency department might be a way to support um, a neighboring community hospital or urban area, urban hospital, um, if there are, is a surge uh, event. So we still want to kind of look at the, the emergency, emergency department um, as a potential way to um, handle a surge of patients. Some other examples that we've seen um, and heard about, um, for instance, conference rooms being converted into patient care spaces. This is at Swedish American Hospital in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, they actually uh, you know, put in some infrastructure into this conference room to handle uh, patients, uh, you know, the, the power and the, the medical gas uh, to do that. So obviously not an ideal environment normally for patient care, but in, a, in a, an emergency situation, this is certainly one option to consider. Uh, cafeterias have been another uh, area of the hospital that's uh, been highlighted as a potential area for surge patients. You know, during the pandemic, uh, cafeteria dietary services may or may, you know, may have been suspended or, or uh, stopped for a, a period of time. And so this space has then become available uh, as well. So uh, Hackensack University uh, Medical Center in New Jersey actually went to the trouble of building headwalls in their cafeteria. Uh, obviously, they're in an urban area with a lot of, uh, a lot of potential uh, patient surges there. So uh, they did this for the COVID-19 response. Um, so just another uh, potential area to consider. And we've all heard a lot about um, temporary structures um, to handle uh, a, a large patient surge. I'm not sure how much of, it, of this was actually done. And I think we were expecting more patients than it really actually occurred uh, because of COVID-19, but it's still uh, certainly something to consider and maybe plan for when we're uh, site planning uh, hospital locations, uh, making sure there's level area for a temporary structure like this. And with that, to make sure there's the adequate uh, electrical and plumbing, services nearby that can connect to these. Um, most of these don't uh, obviously come with all that. They're not connected to, to the grid or, or to a sanitary system. You have to connect to, to the hospital's systems. So that kind of planning needs to be done at the hospital ahead of time. There was even quite a study done on how to convert uh, hotel rooms 
into patient care rooms. This is uh, probably one of those extreme uh, thoughts that, uh, hey, can we use hotels for uh, patient care? It certainly can be done. Um, I think logistically very, very challenging um, in order to get staff and the resources, the supplies uh, all there to do that. But certainly the space uh, makes sense uh, and, and could work. Uh, We've also seen, you know, lots of work being done for, you know, the container type uh, facility uh, that can be shipped very quickly. And these can be pre-built obviously uh, in a factory ahead of time and be ready at any time. Um, but they still need connections to, you know, power and plumbing. Uh, so again, goes back to the point that when we're planning hospitals or, or planning renovations, maybe we should be planning to have those exterior connections to support uh, a temporary facility like this. So just kind of to recap, yeah, there's a lot of different other types of structures and spaces that can be utilized for large surges of patients. I would I think we'd all agree that none of these are really ideal, um, but in a real, uh, real bad situation like we've experienced this year, they're, they're certainly all valid um, areas uh, to consider for surges. There are some tools that uh, were made available early this year by a couple of organizations, and we just highlighted um, a couple here, that, and there's more out there, but uh, the advisory board actually had a really nice um, checklist that they issued to help hospitals uh, plan for the COVID-19 pandemic and how to expand capacity, not just uh, from a facility standpoint, but also from a staffing standpoint, um, a supply chain standpoint and other considerations. So uh, we just highlighted that here. We, we have a link to that. So if, if you haven't seen that, um, please reach out to us and we can share that with you. Uh, similarly, the American Institute of Architects um, that we're involved with, of course, um, issued this preparedness assessment tool earlier this year, uh, which is a really great document to help hospitals and uh, architects and engineers evaluate uh, other types of buildings as a potential temporary patient care spaces. So it's a really thorough checklist to go through and, and make sure uh, the infrastructure is there that's needed, or if it's not, how to deal with it. So. Uh, again, if you have not seen this tool and would like um, to get a copy, please reach out to us and we'll share that with you. Next, we wanna just uh, hit on some of the current actions that we've seen from a regulatory standpoint, um, as well as uh, some of the response uh, needed for uh, on the infrastructure side of the buildings um, in consideration of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. Um, uh, right away, early in March, uh, CMS uh, issued a waiver uh, allowing for alterations of uh, facilities without um, them coming in inspecting and, and other reg you know, normal regulatory procedures. Obviously, then that was an effort to quickly turn spaces around for patient care. And then that opened the door, of course, for, for our states to do the kind of similar actions. And I'm sure you've heard of uh, the waivers that were issued by our State Department of Health. Of course, there was a, a blanket waiver issued um, for conversion of um, standard patient rooms into negative air. Um, <clears throat> normally, there's a lot of um, detail that goes into making a room a negative air room, but they relaxed a lot of those requirements um, to quickly turn these rooms over uh, to negative air. A second blanket waiver was issued um, to convert spaces that were previously unlicensed uh, patient care spaces um, so that they could be made patient care rooms. Um, so that waiver was issued and uh, as well to quickly respond. Um, and then a third waiver issued um, allowing other facility changes quickly as well. Um, each of these waivers though still has uh, terms and conditions, they still wanted to be able to know about it. They wanted to be notified. Of course, you probably know that, as well as being able to have the, uh, the opportunity to do some inspection afterwards. Um, the caveat, the key caveat with these waivers of 
they're meant to be temporary. So um, uh, if any of you or uh, some of the clients that we've worked with have actually wanted to make some of the changes permanent, permanent changes still have to go through the plan review and approval process. We just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, but uh, obviously these waivers are currently still in effect um, till the end of the month. Uh, I think Governor Holcomb's public health uh, declaration is still in force until um, the end of the month, but uh, we'll see if that continues or not. But anyway, these waivers are still in force. And with that, uh, mechanical systems in the building have been a real uh, focus, uh, a course of making more rooms negative air to uh, handle COVID patients. And uh, of course, the, the blanket waiver that was issued by our state made that uh, making negative air rooms um, much easier, much quicker. Uh, we didn't have to necessarily uh, meet the FGI guidelines. Again, unless uh, they're being made permanent negative air rooms, and we did. But um, of course, there's no air change requirement with, with the waiver. Um, uh, Typically, these renovations just require some minor ductwork modifications and maybe an added exhaust fan so that we can get uh, you know, the air out of the room very quickly. Um, so some, you know, some rooms are easier than others. It just depends on the location. Um, the negative air requirement either requires 100% of the uh, room's air be exhausted directly outdoors or uh, we have to use a HEPA filter in order to filter the air if uh, we're not going to be exhausting outdoors. So the HEPA filtering is not as common, but uh, in some cases we need to use that because of the location of the rooms. Um, and, and if there's not a window uh, that's easily taken out, we might have to use a HEPA filter as well if we have to exhaust directly out the window, which we've seen in some cases. Um, it, we don't. We do want to point out, though, that uh, when we make changes to exhausting the rooms, you know, making negative air, that really can affect the uh, the heating and cooling system of, of that area, uh, which could affect uh, patient comfort. So you know, you make sure you want to plan these types of changes with with a mechanical engineer and with your facilities teams, of course. Um, and, and just want to point out too, as we think about future planning, that uh, we want to better plan ahead for making these kinds of changes, um, building in the capacity uh, during new construction or renovation so that if we do have to convert quickly, we don't have to worry about capacity. So uh, that's a conversation that needs to happen early on in design on a project uh, with the engineer and the facilities team to determine what's the right level of added capacity versus you know, cost versus benefit. And then the American Society of Healthcare Engineers also um, helped by uh, looking at, uh, going back to the HEPA filtering scenario. If, if we can't uh, you know, do negative air rooms with the existing um, HVAC system, we may have to bring in a HEPA filtering unit uh, to serve that room. So, they issued a number of different uh, directives and here are some just uh, uh, quick room, patient room uh, caveats that they provided that show different scenarios like the first one on the left. Uh, if uh, needed, we can put a HEPA filter unit out in the corridor um, with a small uh, vestibule that uh, that way we can serve that room without touching the room necessarily. Uh, the second caveat is uh, adding a HEPA filter unit in the room and directly exhausting it out the window. Or the third scenario uh, there is to use a HEPA filtering unit and use the existing uh, return air if that's possible. And of course, you have multi-bed situations that um, we can use HEPA filter units, negative air machines to help uh, circulate and filter the air in a multi-patient room. So, Again, just want to highlight uh, some of the options that are out there for um, the HEPA filtering option. Other considerations for negative air rooms, they still need to have um, uh, the oxygen and vacuum outlets at each bed 
or if that's not possible, uh, have the provisions for portable units. So um, just making them ne negative air is just one step. We still need to have uh, the medical gases there available, and that's part of the waiver uh, that Indiana issued. Uh, the other issue that we touched on earlier was uh, whether or not there's a toilet room available to that, um, to that room. If you're converting a, a non-patient care room into a patient care room, but it doesn't have a toilet room, then you kind of have to deal with that. So uh, under the waiver, uh, it is stated that if you don't have a toilet room, you will have to have procedures for uh, waste removal. So I'm sure you're all aware of that, but um, it's something to consider as well if you haven't. Electrically, um, there's always uh, considerations with electrical and, and, and technology, and especially with COVID-19. Um, the, under the waiver, um, a converted patient room uh, still needs to have at least one duplex outlet. Um, uh, some rooms are easier to do that than others, but it's something to consider. Um, and then, of the course, there may be additional medical equipment, so we may have to have more than one duplex outlet. Um, you need to have adequate lighting, of course, and provisions for nurse call under the, the waiver. Um, and we've added in even um, making sure the area and the room, the patient and the staff are all still safe. So having those safety systems still in place uh, is also an important consideration. Uh, virtual nursing has been uh, talked about a lot. We've seen that happen in some of the larger hospitals, uh, not meant to replace the, the, the nurse going into the room, but certainly as a remote option, uh, the infrastructure needs to be in place for that. So for the future, here's some of the things that we've highlighted um, that we want to start thinking about as we go forward. You know, having those incremental increases for larger uh, patient spaces, having multiple patients in a, in a larger room, but that room doesn't have to be uh, three times larger. Maybe it just needs to be 50 or 75% larger. Um, making, you know, we've highlighted a lot on making private rooms still semi-private capable. I think that's really a key takeaway from this year. Um, we still want to design private rooms, but maybe a percentage of those rooms still have the capability of being semi-private. Making provisions for PPE carts, uh, you know, so they're not out in the hallways. If we can plan space or alcoves for those. Public spaces were a big concern. Um, waiting areas. We still want to have those. We still want to have you know, this, the social engagement when we come to a hospital, but we want them to be safe. So uh, public spaces are a big focus for us right now and how we, how we satisfy both requirements. We've talked a lot about already the HVAC and electrical upgrades and making sure there's capacity in our systems uh, to handle those changes without a great expense. Um, and then talking about staff, they have gone through so much this year. We've already been working on how to support staff um, even before COVID-19 and making their jobs easier. But this year obviously has uh, made it even more so important uh, to how do we support staff, how do we support their health, their mental health, um, making their jobs easier, uh, you know, just providing respite areas or, um, you know, we've heard some hospitals that we've talked to providing massage therapy and or relaxing attendance requirements, providing free lunches, you know, anything uh, that can be done to support the staff that are on the front lines uh, helping uh, through this pandemic is huge. Um, the supply chain uh, was affected early on and probably still is to some degree but we wanna make sure we're planning to make sure that supply chain uh, flows as easily as possible, that there's resiliency there. Um, and then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the culture and that's maybe beyond the architecture and engineering realm, but we can support that in our design work. Uh, one of the hospitals that I talked to recently said the only way they feel like they've survived this year is because they have such a tight family culture. And I thought that was really powerful and we want to continue to support that in our designs. Um, affiliating with other hospitals or systems, uh, partnerships, even going as far as merging with others is certainly a strategy um, to be able to sh share resources more easily. Um, so those are, there's, I'm sure there's many other considerations. Those are the ones that we've seen stand out the most this year. 
Um, and we really appreciate, I've uh, concluded the, the presentation portion uh, right now. So uh, we'd love to open it up for any questions or comments that you might have, or if you've got any other ideas that, uh, that we haven't uh, shared with today, we'd love to hear those as well. Bill, I see no questions in the Q&A function. So I believe that means you covered your topic and objectives perfectly. Uh, okay. We want to thank you for this very interesting presentation and sharing how quickly and efficiently Design Collaborative has responded to the pandemic. Um, I do see something. Okay, one person does have a question. I'm going to let this person um, go ahead, Paula. You may ask your question. Um, hi, Bill. Thank you. Um, I'm, a, I'm a student currently and um, just um, going to go into the 2021 fellowship group with the IRHA. Great. Um, my question is, um, you talked a lot about the vertical and the horizontal head walls. Did you ever right. consider like the overhead units or was that um, an expense issue or is that not relevant anymore? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we the the spaces that we've been seeing uh, converted uh, to patient rooms or rooms that we're putting more patients into uh, typically didn't have uh, the infrastructure needed for the overhead type of headwall unit. Those typically require additional structural um, support members uh, in the ceiling or roof above. And of course, would take a lot more effort to uh, put those in. Uh, if that's if that's answering your question, but um, certainly it's it's a possibility if um, if we put it put those uh, overhead, uh, that certainly would um, be a way of being uh, more flexible. So you're not tied to the head wall. Paula, did that answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I just wondered um, about that because it seemed like it would give a little bit more bed flexibility and yes. ability for treatment. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, and certainly something to consider um, if we're planning spaces to have multiple patients in them, um, maybe having an overhead type head wall system does give that added flexibility that uh, may be needed. You just, just never know what um, scenario might occur in the future. So having that additional flexibility would make some sense. It's a great comment. Great. Again, Bill, we appreciate you sharing your presentation with us. We um, are thankful to everyone who joined us for this webinar. And on behalf of, the, of IRHA, we hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.